Hello and good morning. I'm happy to meet you again. And this morning, I want us to have a conversation. We want to talk about what is on the minds of many Ghanaians today. It's about the quality of education. Four years ago, we were all divided. We're not too sure about how the free SHS program was going to be implemented and how it will run through the years. Four years on, many Ghanaians are now realizing that the implementation strategy perhaps was wrong. This morning, I want to have a conversation with an accomplished academician. We all know her so much that I don't need to tell you much about her credentials. She's the first female vice chancellor in the whole of this country. In 2020, we all heard about her. She was the vice presidential candidate of the National Democratic Congress. Professor Jane Nana Opokwa Jemain is with me in the studio. And today, we want to talk about education in general across all levels. And my first conversation is about how she's receiving the concerns and the debates across the airwaves. And we will walk through the conversation. Madam, thank you and happy to meet you. Thank you very much. Now, Prof, uh, you have been at the Ministry of Education before, and you have seen implementation of various policies. Free SHS became a campaign issue. The former president had his own plan. And the president today also preferred a different solution. Now, having listened to parents, especially the anger, the tone of the students, how does it come to you? It comes to me as a very disturbing phenomenon. And I want to begin by expressing sympathy. I want to sympathize with the students, especially when they say, we are not learning anything. And this is not something I'm making up. We all have children in our families, in our communities, everywhere. And when they are, seem to be saying the same thing, then it's disturbing. And there are countries or places where children have to be motivated even to go to school. They have to be motivated to learn and so on. And if we have children who are already there and they are saying that we are not learning, it means that children want to learn. So some dream is being stifled and that I find disturbing, and I want to sympathize with that. I want to move on to sympathize with the school management, the headmaster, the headmistress, the teachers, the housemasters, the support staff, the kitchen staff, my table people, all of them, because they are all part of the system that supports the school. And it is not so much that things have changed. When you are supported to deal with the change, it's a little easier. So I want to sympathize with them too. And then of course the parents. A parent sending a child to school is expressing hope. It's expressing their confidence in the system to support their child for the best in the child to come out. So when that doesn't seem to be happening, then it is disappointing to the parent, to the community, to the child himself, and even to the school also. So you see there's a whole chain of connections. So, my immediate reaction is sympathy. But having gone that path, uh, it looks that now the bubbles at the bottom of the, po of the pot are coming up and bursting. We are hearing a few more voices. I don't know what took so long. I have personally followed the conversation and the narrative, especially among ordinary parents, is that they would have preferred to pay school fees. I remember before the policy was implemented, the former president made some proposals. Now, looking back and fast forwarding to today, how does it come to you? It comes to me as a missed opportunity in the sense that we had very, very clear proposals. We knew there were parents who could pay. It wasn't by accident that the current Minister for Finance said, who was even you know, expressing the same idea we had, that he could pay for 10 people. There are those who cannot pay for anybody. Okay? So there are, you know, in between those who can pay for 10, who can pay for one or two, there are those who can pay for anyone. And that doesn't mean that those children should be denied education. So what we did was to target. We were, our philosophy is to build the society from the bottom up. So it is those who have been left behind when you talk about people not being left behind. So it, cre it creates the image that we are all in the queue. But there are some who are not in the queue. 
and it's the business of government to bring those people in the queue. So our policies under His Excellency John Drummond in Mahama, his concern has always been about how does this help the underprivileged. So the policies were crafted on that concern to ensure that we are targeting, that we are bringing people on track, that we are helping those who would otherwise have no chance. There are many, many people right now that the government is taking care of who would have had the chance. There are parents who are now saying, we want to pay. But for me, yes, the money part is important, but the, it's, it's the strategy itself that they may wish to review. For example, how come the school reopened, announcement is gone out, students have left home, and on the middle of the road, or even when they have arrived at the school, now you tell them that, no, go back and come back one month. That's not about money. This cannot be about money. Okay? How come in the middle of the term, if the term is extended or cut short? This is not about money. So there are many, many more things that the ministry needs to look at. It raises a question about those who are directly involved in implementation. And for you as uh, an academician who has seen teachers trained at the highest level, somebody who has um, headed a whole ministry, I'm sure you have silent voices within the Ghana Education Service or the Conference of Heads of Assisted Secondary Schools and maybe NACA who may be involved in curriculum research and development and implementation. What have you been picking from people who cannot perhaps talk openly? Yeah, the major thing that disturbs them is, and I've picked from many, I've picked from students, I've picked from parents, I've picked from people in the ministry, outside of the ministry, I've many stories to tell. I don't know how long we have, others that I've told you one or two. No, at least one will not be. Yeah, that. so first, I want to finish and answer your question. And the major concern is that we can't speak, you know. So when they come and give me all these litany of complaints, my question is, but you have your boards, you have your committees. That's a proper channel. Why don't you send all these concerns there so they reach where they need to reach? They say, no, today... We don't even know who to trust. You don't know who is listening to you. Uh, before you know, they transferred you. And I find that very, very unnecessary because it doesn't help anything. Okay, so as for the comments, many. A parent called me, said, I live in, let's say I live in Accra. My child has a day, has been posted to a day school in Suhum. What should I do? It was on the phone. I don't know who gave her my number. And I said, you know, I can't advise you, but I'll tell you what I will do. If I were in your position and I worked in Accra and my child has been put in a day school in Suhum, I've never lived there, I don't know anybody there. If I were you, two things. One, I'll leave my job in Accra, go and live in Suhum, rent the house and know where my child is so I can get him ready to go to school and come back. Because the child going to uh, the SHS is leaving home for the first time and need some support. And at that stage, they are very vulnerable. And they are very vulnerable. Okay, so I don't know about that person dealing with the landlord or any of those. So that's option one. If you cannot leave your job, then bring your child where you are and find a day school close to the premise. And said, well, they said if you do that, then you won't get the free and that, uh, the whatever else. And I said, my sister, so what is, you make a, a choice then. You know, the decision is in your hands, but that's what I would do. I'll have two choices. And if you want to push and ask me which of the choices, I will not leave my job. Because so, how so, am I going to take care so of my it, child? So it gives a reflection of parents who have their own challenges regarding... So it, means that, so it means that the parents have been having challenges. I don't know if there's space for them to express that challenge. When we were in the ministry, we put about is it five or six national service people. We created a hotline. And we advertise the hotline, and we ask any parent who has any challenge, teacher, whatever, just call us. And we also show the people where to take the complaints. Some of them will say, no, I want to talk to the minister. Two minutes, just talk to the person. Maybe you are not even the one to solve the problem, but listen. But if it's about intimidating the people and harassing them and so on, then they will not talk to you. But, Prof, um, just to cut you, um, in all this, the prime objective is to ensure that the children get better education, pass well, and continue. Government's narrative is that the first batch has written, have written their um, uh, 
uh, Wasi, and they did well, which is an indication that free SHS, after all, is not as bad as critics <laughs> would want to put it. And that should defeat some of the concerns we are raising. Listen, I think we're all in this country. We hear about lack of textbooks. The food and the sleeping places, we've also heard plenty about that. But the psychological makeup of the learner is very important. So let's just go to the purely quote-unquote academic ones. We've heard of lack of textbooks. We've heard of teachers who are teaching from three, and by the time they finish, they are too tired to go to form one. We've heard of that. We haven't asked about the state of the science labs. We haven't asked how many experiments the, the chemistry student needs to have and how many has happened. We haven't heard of the equipment that has gone to the labs or to the workshops. We haven't heard of the reagents. We haven't heard of the lab assistants and so on and so forth. And all of these go into the academic performance. We also know what we have heard is about students being given past questions to learn. We have also heard and we have seen students who wrote an exam, came out, and it was like, you know, we've had an earthquake in this country. It wasn't like one um, school or two schools. You are referring to students who were protesting that. This same, group whose, this same group whose performance is supposed to be so outstanding that we shouldn't be talking. It is the group I'm referring to. Okay. And they went and wrote the exam. We heard of the leakage of exams. We heard of invigilators being compromised. We've heard many, many things. And we also saw the students come out and speak about, no, this is not what we were told would happen. Now, these students have A's and we are happy. It's up to us. We will, we will talk about uh, tertiary education because many of these are supposed to move on there. But five years on, because 2017, 2018, we saw this being implemented. Is it about time government acknowledges that, yes, there are real challenges. Let's call a round table for a review because that's been on the table for some time now. You see, I've been asking myself, where are all these voices coming from now? I know some have, have spoken. I know some have paid the ultimate price of dismissal, transfer, a whole lot of harassment. But the voices are now being amplified. And all these other voices have also been in the system all the time. A lot of them working very closely and even implementing. They are the ones telling us there are no textbooks. Okay. So if now they are talking, I think it's good. But I'd like to believe that they are speaking for themselves and for others. If government keeps insisting that they don't have a problem, then their calls for review may not end where it should be. If, if the, um, the originators and the planners or, or the, and the strategists of the free SHS themselves come to acknowledge that, hey, we meant well, um, this is it, we evaluated the situation, we have a major report, these are the challenges we see, come let's talk. It's not wrong with Do it. you think it should happen, a review? Why shouldn't a review happen? When we started the Progressively Free, we had a review mechanism in place. You are starting something new. You can't assume you are not going to have any challenges. You can't assume what you put on paper the first day is, is cast in stone. You are going to look at the situation. You are going to closely monitor the implementation. And you are not going to wait till things come to a head. Because the problems will start coming. And who will tell you what's wrong? It's not the minister. It will be the headmaster. So the headmaster must have the space to tell you what it is. Because he, he is the manager on the ground. The house mistresses we don't appoint them for nothing. They know what the students are going through. Some of the students are even more close to the head, to the housemaster, than to their own friends. So, and listening to the students is important. And all these mechanisms are there already. All you need to do is to hone them, sharpen them, make them function better. The PTA is there. So if all of a sudden PTA shouldn't speak, if they're having their meetings, they shouldn't come to the school, if half of these things are true, then you are not helping the situation. So who will tell you what? It cannot be what you think should be happening. It is what is there that you need to know. Okay. Okay, we'll walk into 
other um, levels of the sector. But before that, I remember in the 2020 electioneering campaign, the NDC candidate then, former President John Mahama, was very consistent in assuring the public that, yes, he knew the problem is real and that he can help fix it within a year. Yes. What could you have done? Well, or what could we have done? Uh, propose? Yes, these problems are real. The first step is to admit that you have a problem. That's the admission. You need to admit you have problems. You need to admit there are more heads than yours. You need to admit there are many stakeholders. And I think uh, in our strategy, the first step would have been to hold stakeholders conference. Maybe you could have started at the regional level, so if it's 16, maybe break the country into three, four parts, and then collate them at the national level. And the stakeholder community should include the parents. It should include parents who used to pay fees and didn't have the double track. It should include parents who have the double track. It should include parents who have voted out of the double track. Many have. It should include the students who have completed, the students who are there. It should include the teachers, the support staff, bring the table people along. And all of these, the community, where these rooms are rented to the young people and so on, they should all come and tell you what it is that they see that is working and what it is that they see that is not working. Out of that dialogue, you fine tune your own strategy. And what would have been the strategy we take to the table. We have already started something called the Progressively Free. We're targeting the children. We're looking at the children who couldn't afford to be in school at all. And we're offering support to them. We would have begged those who were paying, we know it's hard, but please, you support the government. We would have continued to look at the, some of the issues that we know now. For example, uh, crowded classrooms. Or dormitories. Or dormitories. So if the, you see, let me go back to the day school concept. If, for example, there's a community day school, it looks as good as some of the nice schools our children want to go to. But your critics say they were far away from town. No, no, far away from, from where? There are people in Accra who send their children to. This woman who called me is in Accra. Her child is in a day school in Suhu. What is near? Don't listen to that. And if something is far, how do you reach it? We gave all the schools buses. It wasn't for the fun of it. And going forward, we had our strategy to equip the students and the teachers to move. You see, once you make it boarding, it's nice. But it immediately disenfranchises somebody who cannot afford the trunk. Okay? And we are interested in those who will be stopped by these things. So let's say that it's a day school. You can get to school. We were even in, in discussion with the Minister for Transport. We started with Jifa and then Fifi came along to help us with the Ayelolo buses. How can we deploy them at certain times in the day? We had a plan to ensure that the children can move from the community to the secondary school. And let us also be mindful that the secondary school has been broken into two. 95% of the children go to day schools in GHS. So what is it that once you get to secondary school and you don't go to boarding schools, like you can't go to school? Okay. So you can continue the same way from your community to that school by facilitating the entry for you. Lots of people didn't like the day schools because of the performance. So a lot of the things we were doing in the ministry at the time, the day schools were government schools, but we involved the private schools too so that the performance will, will rise for everybody. So talking about the strategy, First, you have the conversation. You know the problems. If it's, you, you build the schools, and we started building the schools. Okay, as at the time we drafted our handing over notes in August, as was expected of us, we have 46 complete ready to function. There were students in them already learning. So for this government, as I said elsewhere, you don't even have to do the concept. I'll, I'll be taking a short break, and when we come back, we'll talk about the recent invitation by the sector minister. Dr. Edithum invited 
former <laughs> ministers of education. I would find out from Professor Nana Jane Opukwajiman if she was invited. The average human body mass should have at least 60% water for optimal performance in any physical or mental exercise. We can help you maintain it naturally. Natural mineral water. Simply natural. Welcome back. This is TV XYZ, and of course, you are following us on Wazel TV. Our conversation this morning is with Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajman. We are looking at the educational sector. She was talking about the strategy and this would have put in place if John Mahama was the president today. And I told you we we're going to ask her if she was invited to the recent meeting that was called by the current Minister for Education. But first, I want us to wrap up on the strategy, Madam. Yes, um, the strategy we have started already and the complaints from the public now is vindicating us. Sure. So we would have continued with that, fine-tuned it, reached more people and dealt with the emerging issues. We knew there would be overcrowding. That is why we start there was overcrowding actually. So in our time, under, under His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, we expanded 125 schools, new dormitories, assembly hall, teachers' flats, and so on, and science labs. We also um, did what we call the quality improvements um, in 175 schools. And these schools, you go in, there's a room called a lab. There's nothing there, so you need to fit it. So it wasn't like... Uh, starting the structure, but given what it was, uh, putting a new dormitory there and so on. There were other schools that we did, um, other forms of uh, expansion and um, raising the quality of learning. Maybe they didn't have a math teacher or they've never had a math teacher and so this is why the performance is so poor or any, whatever, you know, all those things we did. And we also built new schools because you can only expand the existing ones for so long. And in less than four years, we were able to do the drawings, the sketches, we were able to uh, do the projects framework called the Secondary Education Improvement Projects, seek funding, we went to World Bank, and you know the whole process, the long one, and uh, of course the, most of the funding came from the government of Ghana. Um, and we were able to complete 46 as at the time of, write, of writing our handy mover notes. And when we say we've completed, it means it's ready to run. Everything is there. The science lab is fixed, the computer lab is furnished, whatever else, furniture, everything is there to run. The library is stacked with books, you know. So if we were able to do that, and so this government didn't even need to start from scratch. There were lots of buildings very near completion. And on the campaign trail, it was very heartbreaking to see buildings that were as good as they can be used. A small tweak here and there just left. There was one I saw in the ZOT region or Western region where the, the machine that makes the blocks, the blocks that have been made, the chips, the sand had all been overgrown with weeds, the building itself had something growing in the middle like a tree, you know. So you have all of these, definitely you'll have challenges. This is not to say maybe you could have solved all the problems, but could have reduced them considerably. So yes, would have studied the situation, would have listened. A very important part for us in going forward was to listen. Listen to the teachers, listen to the heads, listen to the parents, listen to the children bring them all along the stakeholders meeting and then find solutions that work. And I think what we left, maybe not pristine, but there were solutions that would have worked. And you don't always need to abandon everything. And then now here we are. Okay, so um, you would have been consulting 
if you were in power. And there's a subtle element of that in the meeting which I witnessed recently when the news came out that the current minister had invited former ministers of education. I didn't see you in that picture. I was invited. In fact, I got a phone call from his office and I said, okay, bring the letter. They didn't state a date in the phone conversation. I saw the letter here on a Thursday. The meeting was on a Friday, on a Monday. I was going to be out of town. The meeting was on 10th of May. The 9th of May was the Mother's Day. I had chosen to spend it at an orphanage in the Western region for very personal reasons. And I wasn't going to be here on Monday at 10 to attend the meeting, so I was out of town. So, um, I, I don't know how it may appear, but for the expectant person who is watching television now, if you had been in that meeting, is there one thing you would have told Edutrum? It would have depended on the agenda. Why is he calling us? The letter said to tap our experience in what? So it depends on why he's calling us. And <laughs> then we would have spoken. Okay. Have spoken. Now let's look at um, basic education today. I've heard conversations about the new curriculum, textbooks, uh, governments plan to introduce a new policy that will drive education at that level. What do you see? What are your worries, if there is? Um, I want to see the plan. I and more importantly, I want to see the rationale for the plan. Every so often we do what we call reviews, and I mean educational reviews and educational reforms, rather. Reform was the word I was looking for. And the question I've asked myself is that, what study has been done on the existing one? What issues are we solving? Is it because somebody feels that children are not learning? That is legitimate, but what else should we know? Where is the report? We need to have that. At the basic level, we, the, we don't call it basic for nothing. This is where you get your basic skills, basic functioning skills in your education, reading, arithmetic, or you know, uh, reasoning, and so on and so forth. And I just heard or read somewhere this morning that the recommendation is that, oh, the teachers should use the old textbook. So are they using the old textbook for the new syllabus? There's some confusion there that should be cleared. And this is not about parents paying fees. There's a lot of work that they need to do. What did you change the syllabus for? How do you change it without a textbook? So who is going to use the textbooks? Have you done your pilot? Is, it, is the textbook responding to identified problems? When we came to the ministry, what we saw was a very serious textbook issue. What we saw was one textbook to three children in the public schools. And I said, no wonder many parents are voting with their money outside, you know, away from the public schools. But this problem can be fixed because the majority of our population use this. Uh, public schools. Yes. And they deserve the best too. So what is the problem? One of them was lack of textbooks. So the parents who can afford to take them to the private schools and buy books. But at the basic level, we are practicing the FQ. So government should provide them. So what did we do? We prioritized that. And by the time we left, instead of one book to three children, every child had four books. And we also saw there was some teacher absenteeism, not some. Significant, 27% is too high. I think we're only second to, well, I won't mention the country, to another country on the continent. And that didn't look good enough. We sat with the teachers. And for me, the comforting thing was that a lot of the teachers themselves wanted that situation to change. So we got a lot of support from them. And we were able to push it down from 27 to 7%. I don't know where it is at now, or even anybody cares about that. But you need to know. And apart from that, we also did a study to see, OK, so out of those who come, how much time do they spend on task? The percentages were really, really disturbing. On the average, it was 35%. This is not possible. So you need to find what is it. Talk to the teachers. What's the problem? They will tell you their problems, and you try to remove them one after the other. And the results began to show. And it's one of the things I'm very proud of, that by the time uh, we have put in all this support from parents, from the students themselves, from the teachers, from everyone who wanted our system to improve, and especially from His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, who understood that, yes, we may not have envisaged this. We didn't know it was coming, but this is where we are at. We need this help. And he never shook his head at us because he always believed that we need to get education right. So we want to use this platform to thank him. 
And he knows I don't flatter, so when I say so, it's so, you know. So we're able to increase the textbook. And then we also realized that the reading proficiency was low. So what did we do? We introduced the reading project, translating books into languages and so on and so forth. And the results were showing. And they were very encouraging, as I was saying. I was very proud to notice that by the time we were exiting in 2016, when we had the President's Award for BEC students, 13 out of the 20 students, we had 10 regions then, were coming from the public schools. It had never happened. It means, you see, we started from the premise that every child can learn. So if now you've introduced a new syllabus, what for? And when you introduce a new syllabus, it should be in relation to the economy. The children in class one will use that at what time? So we were very interested in what the, GN, uh, the Development Planning Commission people were doing, their 40-year plan, to see, okay, so if we introduce this, give or take, no one can tell the future. We never saw COVID was coming. But give or take, where should this workforce be? How well should they prepare? So it was being tailored to meet the needs in anticipation of what... This is what it is. That is why I said when you send your child to school, it's an expression of hope. It's an expression of faith. So in all this uh, conversation, either basic or secondary, definitely they would have to pass through a higher level. Definitely, tertiary. yes. And so we have different levels. Now, let's see where the situation is today. Because just before December last year, there was a lot of agitation over the pre, uh, that's uh, the, the uh, public universities bill. And today we are talking about free SHS students. If they are passing a mass as government wants to put it, there may be challenges in terms of admission at that level. Now, what have you seen is likely to be the potential challenge that is a gap that needs to be filled? Okay, let's start with the public universities. Bill. I'm a member of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Okay. We have an education chapter. We reacted to this bill and we wrote to government. So they know the position. The union spoke, everybody spoke, and so on. And now it's been shelved. I don't know what's happening to the bill now. But the most dangerous part, you see, the minister is in a political position. That is very, very important. And the university must not be under any circumstance. You start doing this at the university, you collapse the country. It's the quickest you know, <laughs> way to destroy the country. Are we saying that all of a sudden, you're going to have a vice chancellor, you're going to have a dean, who doesn't qualify to be there? Is that what is going to happen? Because there's a clause there that says, is a minister who is going to tell them what to do and they should comply. That is wrong. That is completely wrong. We are members of many, many associations. We are members of the AAU, the Association of Africa Universities. We are members of the Commonwealth Universities Association. We are members of ISUS, of UNESCO. How, how do you do this? And one of the strengths we have had is our autonomy at the university. And autonomy doesn't mean you wake up and do what you like. No, that's not what it is. You work within statutes, you work within the regulations, and you promote the interests of the country. So when a student comes to you, do you care where the student is coming from? Your job is, whatever I'm teaching is just going down. Is the student getting it? Is he not getting it? How well can I support the system? That's all there is. So the controls must come from within. The controls must come from within in association with similar institutions. We have our VCG, the Vice Chancellor's Ghana. Okay. We ha when we have our programs, we propose programs. We don't propose them out of the air. We propose them so NAB goes through NCT and so on and so forth before they are approved. So it is not so much that the minister will give an order and then the, no. So that, that is not right. And you are talking about children moving from the secondary to the tertiary. The tertiary needn't be the university only. So some talk about open university or open higher education. You understand it better. Can you briefly uh, walk us into it and what perhaps... Uh, you see, is? we have had what we call the massification in higher education. Maybe once upon a time, just a few people went to the university, if you talk to some of the older people, they'll tell you, oh, in the school of engineering, we were five. It means the country was not ready to work. Five people, what are they going to do? So the doors were flung open. Many more people went. So we need to introduce modes that go beyond the physical 
you know, space learning. At that level, hopefully, you can learn on your own. You can learn some of it on your own. So you need to put in the mechanism to make that happen. Maybe on your computer, distance learning, model, you know, Especially learning in models. This -COVID era. So you see, we had, we didn't know COVID. Nobody knew COVID was coming. But it depends on the kind of preparations you had. Why is it that in some countries, children were able to learn at home? Of course, it's never the same as face-to-face, -face, given the age of the learner. But maybe they did a little better than we did, because we have not caught up as we should. But all these models existed. And we had done something similar at the, in the ministry during the time of His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. And uh, we did the I campus. We inaugurated in one of our E blocks. And the I campus, you know, so that in the, when you go to the computer lab, you have your lessons, you have your books, you have so many things already in soft copy. You can learn on your own. And what we added that I found very, very attractive was to have teachers teach areas of subjects that students find difficult. Maybe if it's, I don't know, differential equation, you don't know what it is, you don't understand. So you decide that if differential equation comes, I'm going to ignore it. And if at that question is either or, and you've already cancelled differential equation, and you're not very strong in the other, you're already on your way to failing. <laughs> so better we prepare you for both, so that when you say it's a choice, it means I could have done either or, but I feel I'm stronger here. Not that I couldn't have done this other one at all. So we're getting teachers, filming them on teaching, and I remember when we started, we had so many countries' names with help coming to the ministry, saying they had money, they could help us, they will bring their experts. And I said, no, part of our business here is to grow our own experts. Okay? We have, teach we have schools that are doing well in those subjects. Where are the teachers? Can we find them? Can we motivate them? Can they support us? Madam. <laughs> I'm sure if I decided to keep you here, we'll talk for the rest of the day. I can imagine. And I enjoyed the conversation because at certain moments I could see or feel the passion because this is somebody who is an academician who loves education and could sympathize with parents. And I also saw through the conversation uh, policies that are still pending that can be adopted. Now, religious leaders, Charles, for example, and it is very instructive are all wishing that there will be a conference to look at the whole thing again. We are wrapping up in a minute. I want you to look into the camera <laughs> and speak to Ghanaians. Okay. Um, there's a saying that goes that it is bent, it's not broken. Education can be fixed. It can be fixed with the right strategies, the right support, the right attitude. There is I mean, there are solutions. What is happening is not like it's not raining. Even then, we know that when we take better care of our environment, we are, the clouds will not run out of water. So I'll say that there's hope. We can fix this problem, and we need a chance to fix it. Mendasi. Mendasi. <laughs> to wrap up, what a tumor commander. <laughs> and so when I heard about her name, I told myself that this a woman who perhaps comes from a place where I grew up. <laughs> and see, I mean, I don't know my best in Asia. But that's it. I mean, sure. On show also. On show will be absolutely. TV, that's why I said, no, it's not TV, that was it. But that's it. Bye-bye. <laughs>